holy cow, another woman was murdered in Colorado, and this list just keeps growing. It's not Kelsey Schelling. It's not Suzanne Morphew. And it's not even Shannon Watts we're talking about. The newest victim is a 55-year-old named Michelle Scott, but she's not the only murder case we're exploring this week. It's time for Profiling Evil's Weekly Crime Recap. Well, welcome to this week's Crime Recap on Profiling Evil. I want to start with the bizarre circumstances surrounding the murder of Michelle Scott, who was reportedly missing when she didn't show up for a neighborhood Super Bowl party. The Jefferson County Sheriff's Office sprang into action on this one, and the following day, which happened to be Valentine's Day, they located Scott's boyfriend, Wayne Lotz, driving the missing woman's red Toyota Highlander. Why on earth was he there? Lotz is a convicted felon with a long history of arrests in several states. He, he has arrests for charges like robbery, grand theft auto, burglary, aggravated assault with a weapon, and domestic violence, including five previous domestic violence cases where Scott was the victim. I mean, my first question is, why on earth did Scott continue to see this guy? At what point will the justice system say enough's enough on this in and out system we have? Well, it would take a day before police could get permission from Scott's family to enter her home and conduct a welfare check. But once they got inside, they found evidence of a struggle and what appeared to be blood smeared on the side of a truck in the driveway. Now, that takes us back to this police stop a day earlier when Lotz was stopped in her vehicle. Remember, it was her red Toyota. And when questioned, Lotz told police that he was simply borrowing the Toyota while she was on vacation with her neighbor and her neighbor's husband. <laughs> well, this guy apparently failed the rocket science course because police knew he was lying. The neighbor he was speaking about was actually the person who reported her missing. An easy lie to disprove. Now, the officer who pulled Lotz over also made note of a large knife he saw in the front seat of the Toyota wrapped in some paper towels. Media reports state that Scott's credit card was in his pocket, and, and when asked how he obtained her vehicle, he said his boss dropped him off at her home a few days earlier. Again, he failed the test. His boss disputed that scenario. Lotz's inconsistent stories were stacking up but police had to let him go because they simply didn't have any evidence to support that some crime had occurred. Well, that all would change the following day when they arrested Lotz on February 15th. It was also the day they found Scott in a ravine near her home. Based on the little bit of evidence that we've been able to obtain through all these public sources, it appears to me that the following could have happened. I mean, it's likely that the homicide of Michelle Scott occurred on probably February 11th or 12th. Now, evidence would suggest that Scott's home was entered by force. That, that's supported by the damage found inside the home. We can also theorize that she was incapacitated in some form inside the home. Now, blood was discovered smeared against a truck in the driveway, and we're going to have to wait for forensic reports to learn whether it was uh, Scott's blood or it came from some other source. Again, we can only theorize at this point that the blood was hers. But in order for it to land on the truck outside of her residence, you have to kind of think through this and imagine in your mind. Scott would have had to either stumble from her home and rub her hand against the truck or whatever it was that transferred the blood, or she was carried from the home by a person who was transporting her body and mistakenly bumped up against the truck. Now, again, we don't know whose blood it is on the truck. And like you, I'm going to be impatiently waiting for word on that forensics. From there, though, it appears that the killer would have had to have transported her body from the residence to the disposal site where she was discovered on February 15th. Now, there's no indication of how law enforcement discovered the site, but I'm kind of suspecting that it happened through a confession. 
law enforcement did release that Scott's Toyota license plate was captured on an LPR reader. That's called a license plate reader in two locations between her home in and then in the Denver area. You can see it on this map. Uh, the this LPR collections were in the Lakewood area and Highlands Ranch area, which, which is where I believe Lot's boss lives. Now, her body was recovered in a ravine near Pleasant Park and Highgate Road, according to, to reports. I couldn't dial in Highgate Road, but I did find a high grade road about five and a half miles east of, La of Scott's home. Now, there's a couple of key pieces of evidence in this case. And number one, I think, is going to be that knife. I don't know if law enforcement was able to recover it when they saw it on the front seat of her car. And I suspect if it was there, it was probably disposed of after the police let him go. But any DNA recovered on that instrument, coupled with an autopsy report, could reveal how this woman died. Police aren't saying how she died, and I'm not saying that Lots committed homicide, but I am reminding you that this guy was driving her vehicle. He had a documented history of violence against people. He had a credit card, her credit card, which was that he was using and was in his pocket. And frankly, all of his alibis seemed pretty weak. Now, another piece of valuable evidence is going to be the forensic examination of the vehicle. Think about it. Think about the Morphew case. They're going to be looking at the locations that that vehicle were, uh, traveled during that period of time. They're going to be looking at things like cell phone data and anything else electronically and forensically that they can look into. Also, think about the fact that they got to learn up if it's Scott's blood on anything that they recover. Now, that might mean looking in the back of her vehicle to see if maybe that was used to transport her to this location where she was disposed. Perhaps there will be tire tracks at the disposal site that match her vehicle or dirt similar to the disposal site still in the tread of those tires. So there's a lot of forensics work that's got to be done. This case is really interesting and frankly incredibly sad. Again, think about this. Lots had a violent history documented by criminal convictions that included at least five domestic violence cases where Scott was the victim. I got to go back and ask the question again. Why did she continue to see this guy? And will the evidence prove that he had something to do with her death? Now, let me know what you think about this case. This is the kind of case that really gets my blood boiling. It really frustrates me, folks. So please, if you are in a relationship that is fraught with domestic violence, get out, get away. These things don't get better. They, chances are they're only gonna get worse. So please, call your medical or your mental health provider or reach out to your local law enforcement agency and get some help immediately. Now, let's talk about the next case. In a case that Profiling Evil helped our friends over at Adventures with Purpose on, the remains of a person found in a vehicle that belonged to Rosemary Rodriguez have positively been identified as hers. The vehicle was discovered in some trees near her home on December 30th of, of last year. Now, that's only a few months ago. Police are not releasing the cause of death, and the case has remained under investigation. Now, this one is really interesting because of the circumstances surrounding her mysterious disappearance. I mean, was it a homicide or simply a tragic accident? Rosemary was last seen leaving her boyfriend's house. It continues to bug me how they, these seemingly committed loved ones simply quit communicating with law enforcement. They, they certainly don't seem to be out like others tirelessly searching for the love of their lives. I mean, think about David Robinson, the father of Daniel Robinson. This guy moved to be near the area where his son disappeared, and he looks every single day for his son. There's a big difference in behavior. Anyway, my thoughts are on Rosemary's daughters, who have had the privilege of speaking with a number of times. And, and of course, 
I have to extend my appreciation to my good friend, Jared Lysick of Adventures with Purpose. He gives of his time and his special talent to help families just like Rosemary search for their loved ones. So thanks for letting us be a part of the journey, Jared. And we hope that, uh, that Rosemary's family is finding some kind of peace in this next step of closure. Now, I want to turn my attention to the case of Kylan Schulte and Crystal Turner down in Moab, Utah. This, this was the couple found murdered just outside of town. It sounds like police might be tightening the noose on this creepy guy that they reported to friends the night before they were brutally murdered. I joined Vinnie Politan on Court TV this week to talk about the case that once had people thinking that the killer was Brian Laundrie. Do you remember that? For those of you who have been with me for a long time, you're going to remember that I stated back then that I didn't think Laundrie had anything to do with the Moab case. To me, the behaviors just didn't match up, and it's shaken out that way that it didn't. Well, here's where we are. Salt Lake City reporter for ABC4, Marcus Ortiz, reported that there was new and compelling information released in an unsealed search warrant this week about a possible suspect. The document stated that a sheriff's deputy pulled over a 27-year-old guy after the two women were reported missing. And this is the thing that was really interesting. It was so unique, the detective remembered his odd behavior and how it really stood out so much that investigators decided to serve a search warrant on the man. The deputy who stopped him said that the person was unnerving for someone who had been pulled over for speeding. He learned that the man routinely sleeps in his vehicle, and closer investigation revealed that he was known to make unwanted advances toward women, many of them commenting that he made them feel uneasy. Do you remember when Schulte and Turner told their friends about that creepy guy hanging around? Really interesting thinking about that. But the deputy remarked that the man may have been mentally ill, when the deputy asked him if he had seen the women, he simply responded that he'd seen them before in the Moonflower, quite regularly, in fact. But what really caught the deputy's attention was the, the man's vague response when he'd asked him specifically questions about the couple. Number one, he said he didn't know that the two were married, adding that he had nothing against gay people. Now, he couldn't really say where he was on the nights in question, but he did respond emphatically with no when he was asked if he killed the couple. Take a minute, listen to my interaction with Vinny as we discuss the feelings the deputy had as he spoke with this particular suspect. Let's watch this. Mike King, from this part of the search warrant, I'm going to read a little bit more of it in, in, in just a bit, but the thing that struck me is, and I always think of, you know, you know, your podcast, Profiling Evil. This is evil that would take the lives of these uh, uh, two women. Um, this veteran law enforcement officer is making a traffic stop and is so unnerved, doesn't want to leave to write the speeding ticket. That, I mean, that tells me volumes about how creepy this guy was. And I think if you talk to any police officer, they've all probably experienced a similar dynamic where they just have shivers running up and down their spine saying something's not right and I need to keep my eyes on this individual. I had flashbacks as you were reading through that, Vinny, of interviewing a couple of serial killers in particular who would get euphoric and you use the word and they use the word in the affidavit, euphoric feeling they would get euphoric as they were kind of visualizing and reliving the experience of committing a homicide now this is a couple of days after if if jason's got the times dialed in right and he's been you know right on the on the ground there working with the family and and with law enforcement but uh it, that is a really peculiar term and it's something that i've witnessed a number of times where i've seen them especially if you get a predator who's reliving the experience and talking through the experience. Now, on the flip side, it could be a red herring. I mean, I've been pulled over. I've never been euphoric about it, but my pulse has been running and I've been dealing with law enforcement my entire life. So um, it's hard to, to take that and go too far with it 
it's going to be really interesting to see what additional information comes out. And I got to hand it to uh, Sheriff White and his team down there. I, I worked homicides when I was running cold cases for the attorney general. I, I worked homicides with Sheriff White on a number of occasions, and I know that he's very good at what he does. But putting a case like this together really takes a long time, as you well know, Vinny. And, and we all have to be just a little bit patient when we don't want to be in hopes that they put all the puzzle pieces together so that it's a case that really sticks and they're able to get a, get a, get a conviction when the day comes. All right, Mike King, I heard you say you want to, see, you want, you want to hear some more. Let me get to more of this um, affidavit. Good, let's do it. Because there is more, folks. Wait till you hear this. Okay. And boy, was there more. I mean, listen as Vinny shares more of the details found in the search warrant affidavit. Now, I want to mention that Jason Jensen, the investigator who's been dogging this case in behalf of the family, has, is a great guy to work with. And I was really glad that he was on this segment tonight. Now, you're probably going to be as intrigued as I was about some of the physical evidence that was seen. My question is simple. Was it collected? I don't know, but let's listen. Um, the subject was asked if he knew his whereabouts for Friday night, Saturday night, or Sunday night. He could not give any times and stated he would travel to a spot that he often slept at as it was away from people. That's creepy. Described the location that he would normally sleep at as 100 to 300 yards up the loop road from the Moab Overlook on a dirt road and that he had left a blanket there. He had no one to corroborate his story or his location. Law enforcement located two blankets and a jacket, and they observed what they believed to be blood on the jacket, just as Jason Jensen told us. This location would cause uh, Kylan and Crystal to pass it on their way to their campsite. They've got to go past this location. This location is 8.8 .8 miles via the road from the scene where Kylan and Crystal were found, but is less than four miles if a straight path is taken. It sounds like it's someone who's a little bit more familiar with the area, not necessarily one of these drifters that's just flowing through if you're off the beaten path a little bit there. It really makes you start to wonder if they were targeted and uh, this was fantasized and thought out or if it was an opportunistic kind of a killing where someone just happened to be at the right spot at the wrong time for this couple. And uh, that's what's really challenging in these kinds of cases. But man, doesn't this make you wanna know if they collected that jacket and tested the DNA in that blood and the DNA on the jacket to kind of put two and two together? I hope that that shoe will drop soon too. Well, as we wrap up this week's crime recap, I want to chat for a moment about Jermaine Charlot, an indigenous woman that I've appeared on court TV in the past to talk about. It's a person I've even discussed on Profiling Evil separately. We chatted again last night in hopes of keeping this story alive. If you remember, uh, Charlot disappeared about three years ago, and many eyes have been focused on her boyfriend, who, <laughs> you guessed it, went silent and quit looking for her. Now, I'm not saying that he's responsible for her disappearance, but Jermaine's family and her friends find it awfully suspicious. Well, there's one thing we do know, and that is that her boyfriend was arrested for hitting her in the past. And last year, he was indicted for owning guns, something that was against his probation. Now, as a reminder, Let's watch this court TV appearance regarding this missing persons case. Uh, still with me tonight, retired police commander, host of the Profiling Evil podcast, Mike King, and private investigator Jason Jensen. Uh, Mike, this the France guy, the France guy, um, history of assaulting her, firearms in trouble. Uh, obviously, that's the first place uh, that investigators are looking and have been looking. Um, but it doesn't seem that they have enough yet uh, to bring any charges here. You, you hope in these kinds of cases that the pressure continues to mount on the individual or individuals who are responsible for these kinds of heinous acts. Uh, the feds turned up the heat. They they uh, took him back and, and uh, 
leveled the charges and, and the uh, probation violations against him. Uh, now the question is, it's been a couple of months since we last visited this case. Uh, has that made a difference? Is the pressure continuing to mount if, in fact, he's responsible? But all we can say is that we know that there was past destructive behavior in the relationship, and, and that certainly doesn't mean he's responsible, but you have to continue to look at that and look at the effort that he's put in to find it. And that, I guess that's the thing that continues to trouble me in these cases, Vinny, as we go over cases like this over and over again, is the person closest to him, uh, you, you see these polar opposites of, of digging all in and nothing gets in the way of looking for him. And then you see others who kind of just wash their hands and move on with life and uh, don't look back. And that's really frightening and it's really frustrating for all of us. It's also a time for the law enforcement folks to maybe re-examine all of the information and see if there are some things that maybe they could release to the public because there is a huge machine of public out there that would love to share information if they only knew what was being asked for. Well, you, my friends, are that public machine that I was speaking about. This is the kind of case that's going to boil down to somebody who knows something saying something. I mean, I think Jermaine Charlo deserves justice. Do you? Well, I want to thank Vinnie Politan and the Court TV team for the chance that I have each week to go on and look at these ongoing criminal cases and, and the cold cases that we look at. I hope that you'll go over to their channel and watch my entire interview. And now it's time for you to weigh in on these cases, and I hope you'll do so down below. Take a moment, share what really makes your blood boil as you look at this type of behavior repeated time and time again. I mean, how do we teach our children to avoid narcissistic personalities? How do we prevent them from becoming narcissists themselves? I'm going to be watching for your comments, and, and thanks for taking time to do so. Remember that you can find Profiling Evil on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And if you like podcasts, go and look for Profiling Evil on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget, check us out on the World Wide Web at ProfilingEvil.com. Please take a moment, hit that like and subscribe button. And don't forget to consider joining our channel memberships. My favorite's the academy level, where you get all kinds of information not available anywhere else. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon at the next crime scene.